Do you know how many people we have for today? Right now we have three and I believe we were had 22 joining us. Good morning, everyone. As um, you're joining us, we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes and then we will get started and I will do introductions at that time. Thank you for joining ElderWorks this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm hoping it isn't too cold and blustery where you are, because I'm convinced that um, sitting where I am today, it's I can hear the wind very clearly. Um, so I hope you're all very warm. Um, and uh, it warms my heart to have you join us today. Um, today, um, we, um, a couple of, of, of little notes I want to get out of the way. Um, we are, just as a reminder, we are recording um, this event, um, and it is currently on Facebook Live. Um, and then this presentation will also be posted on our ElderWorks YouTube station. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about ElderWorks um, from my point of view. We are a non-for-profit 501c3 organization, and our mission is to provide older adults, seniors, and their families with information, referrals, guidance to keep them living well at home or if they need to make a transition, we will help with that. We also supply the education and different support groups. Um, this uh, education that I mentioned does include um, for consumers or community members, family members and our professionals. We really focus on having seniors age well and with the dignity and respect that they so richly deserve. If you have any questions today throughout the presentation, please use the question answer button um, on your screen and then I will um, get those questions answered for you. After the webinar, you will see popping up on your screen a survey. I would greatly appreciate it if you just take a couple minutes to fill out that survey. It's very important for us to know your feedback so that we can provide quality um, consumer education and it helps us understand what topics you'd like to see next. Now, I have the honor and privilege of introducing Chris Petrick, my coworker, who is an amazing 
lady, a little bit about her. She actually has over 30 years of experience. You wouldn't tell it because she has a Peter Pan soul. She's never going to grow up and she is full of life. And I think it's her grandchildren that keep her that way. She has a cross section of such an experience. She has, as a past adjunct um, faculty at a local community college, Chris developed and implemented curriculum. Um, she also has held positions as director of staff education and resident wellness. Um, she had, has a passion. She learned early that she had a passion for those with dementia and she became a dementia certified instructor so that her staff and those around her could learn more about the disease and leading to a better overall life and quality positive interactions between the staff and the individuals living with dementia. Um, in her spare time, which we keep her very busy at Elderworks, she enjoys spending time with her husband, Russ, and the seven grandchildren that she loves to be called Gigi by. Without further ado, here's Chris Petrick. Thanks, Nina. What a great, uh, great uh, introduction. So welcome all for those out there in the community who have been uh, with me before. Welcome back. And for those of you who are, who are taking advantage for the first time uh, in ElderWorks consumer education, um, welcome. We're going to talk about psychology of aging and quality of life. Um, before I get started, what I'm going to do is get rid of all these little boxes that we have um, on here so they don't, um, let's see, hide floating meeting controls. Now you're going to see, um, you should not see anything up there. It looks like there's, um, please move this window away from shared application. That's something that has never popped up again uh, before. So hopefully that will go away or not bother anybody out there. We're gonna talk about the psychology of aging and the quality of life. It's really physical and psychologically um, how we age and the quality of life. And, and I really wanna say before we even begin, quality of life for everybody is gonna be a little bit different. I'm just giving you information um, about what studies say is considered successful aging. And again, successful aging for everybody is going to be a little bit different. Also. Excuse me, Chris. Yes. Is your screen up right now? Yeah. Is it not uh, showing? I have a plain screen right now. Okay. You have a plain screen on. Okay. Well, that's weird. Okay. So I'm going to start a new share. I'm going to stop this share. And we're back. Hi, everybody. Let me uh, do the shared screen again. Perfect. Can you see it now? Yes. All right. That means everybody can see it. <clears throat> Great. Thank, Let me just thank you this. so much, Chris. Sure. That was weird because we had a, a one little um, box up there that never popped up before. So I don't know what the glitch was, but we're ready to roll. Um, we're gonna talk about what we're gonna uh, learn today or our objectives and uh, really what is considered successful aging. And again, I don't want anyone to feel bad about themselves. Successful aging for each person is gonna look a little bit different. We are gonna talk about some of the physical dynamics of aging, particularly the brain understand the psychological dynamics of aging, review what I think is important, Erickson's stage of development and the impact it has on older adults. And that really just talks about um, as we move uh, through life, we have to meet milestones before we can move on to another stage of um, age and development. So uh, it's just a quick review and I just wanna talk how it kind of inner um, meshes with um, uh, our, our personhood and who we are and how we find success. What quality of life um, will mean for different people, how attitude and gratitude can keep you young at heart, very, very important, and how to stay healthy as you age, which also is difficult and important, uh, but it can be done. As you grow older, three things um, happen. 
the first is your memory goes. And then uh, I can't remember the other two. Um, and that's probably many of us out there saying, yeah, they'll laugh at that and go, yeah, that's me. Um, and that's me also. I'm an older adult, as you probably saw on the screen. I didn't uh, go to a hairdresser to pay for this gray hair. It's, it's mine. Um, so uh, the, although this is tongue in cheek, um, it really is part of who we are. Are we all success, successful at, at aging? Um, aging really involves our continuing so survival. Do we want to just survive old age? Um, and for many people, they may say, yes, I have so many what we call comorbidity, so many illnesses that um, if I can just get through this and be um, happy with what I have. Now, other people are gonna say that looks differently for me. I wanna challenge my body and do the, the best. Um, negative outcomes are always associated with aging. It really depends on how you look at those outcomes um, and, and how you challenge those outcomes uh, with aging. And we don't openly discuss age because it's our age. There is something out there. Um, I'm currently doing a program on bias. And we're talking about one of the biases of ageism. And um, ageism is a bias towards people who are older. And um, we have certain um, qualities um, or what people think are some of our qualities of aging that, that unduly uh, categorize us. And society does ca uh, categorize us and they continue those negative myths about aging. So what is successful aging? According to Wallace and Rowe, uh, and these are people that study successful aging, that's really being free of disability or disease. Um, there, you have to be pretty lucky to be free of any disability or disease by the time you age, um, uh, you know, age into older adulthood. Uh, my knock on wood, my husband is 75 and the only thing he takes every day is a vitamin. That's it. Um, he has no other, um, although he's going to the doctor next week for his annual Medicaid, Medicare exam, so I don't want to jinx him, but um, uh, right now, today, he is free of disability or disease. He's actually working today. So, um, you know, we, both my husband and I find, and we'll talk about um, uh, jobs and uh, hobbies and how they can keep us healthy. Having high cognitive and physical abilities, interacting with others in a meaningful way. Um, you look at these and, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you, um, and you don't have to answer this, I'm just going to say, which is the most important to you? Um, is it being free of disability or disease? And, and ultimately, do we have control over all of that? Because we really think about our, our family and we think about genetics and I inherited my high blood pressure from both sides of my family. So, um, you know, we look at that, having high cognitive and physical abilities, that's very important to me. And then interacting with others in meaningful ways. You have a hard time doing this if you can't, if you're not here. So again, we look at what successful aging is according to the researchers, but what is successful aging to us? It is difficult to define, and it's gonna be different for each person. It does not have to be void of chronic illnesses or disabilities. We all can live with, um, with some chronic illnesses, uh, such as high blood pressure, maybe some um, cardiovascular disease, maybe having a thyroid problem. So a lot of people live successfully and do have a chronic illness or a disability. Um, what we can do is use the seven tenets of health to guide us, and we'll be going over those. And how you feel um, is how you really are. So, um, you know, there's days where you wake up and you really feel your age. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do where we live um, and why we choose to live in a state that has pretty brutal winters. Um, and it takes forever to get through spring, as we all know, looking outside. Um, but, uh, you know, 
there's days that that we all feel a little bit older than we really are. And I think environment has a lot to do with it. Um, some of us may have arthritis, some of us may have autoimmune diseases. So, you know, those kind of um, ebb and wane. And so we, we do have days where um, we feel better than others. This is um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, this is something that we, we learn in child development or we learn in nursing school if you've ever taken um, classes in um, you know, uh, mental health. And the reason I wanna share that with you here is because Maslow was a researcher and what he said was, he was a psychologist and what he said is that the hierarchy of needs are built in a pyramid. And basically what he says is, and this is, the, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, but what he said is you have to meet these needs first. If you have food, water, warmth, and rest, and then you can move to security and safety, then the rest will follow. But unless you have this, and unless you have this, these are what we call our basic needs. We can't meet our psychological needs and we're not gonna be able to have uh, self-fulfillment. And why I bring this up is there's a lot of older adults out there who are living under the radar and they're living in poverty and it's difficult for them to get food, water, warmth and rest, security and safety. Think um, of the older adults living in the Ukraine right now and how this has been completely eliminated for them. So they're not going to be able to do any of this until they get this back. And that's really what Maslow says. Now, so to be successful in aging, we have to have these met. And that doesn't mean we have to have a gazillion dollars in the bank. It doesn't mean we have to have the biggest house on the block. What it means is we have to have at least those basic needs met. And I know for some people, because of inflation and because of um, you know, past illnesses or lack of employment, sometimes these are not being met. So for some people, successful aging is going to be difficult. We know that in the psychology of aging, biological factors will pay, play a role. I know that um, in physical aging, I should say, um, we know that, like I mentioned, both of my parents um, had high blood pressure. And so um, it just makes sense that there's probably a gene for um, high blood pressure that is modified and or skewed. And so, um, you know, there's family members, including myself, my siblings, that need to take medication for, for um, high blood pressure. Does that mean that I can't age successfully? Absolutely not. As long as I take my medicine, I try to keep my weight down, I stay active, I'm successfully aging, even with those biological factors. We know that behaviors can modify your brain. They've done, done lots of study and we're gonna talk about having a positive attitude but a positive attitudes and positive behaviors release more endorphins, which are the feel good um, neurons in your brain or the chemicals in your brain that get released. And it helps um, create more synapses and have your brain connect better. So, um, and, and there's a couple of pictures I have of MRIs. I think that will show you um, what an aging brain looks like, but we'll talk about what happens when you exercise and what happens to your bridge then. Um, biological aging and psychological function share a similar connection. We know that um, there's a mental illnesses in the family and we know that people either see the glass full or the glass half empty. And we know that there's a connection between um, physical and psychological aging. And so um, one of our jobs in successful aging will be to keep that glass half full instead of half empty. Having biological markers of dementia, such as what we call plaques and tangles, do not necessarily mean that you will have dementia. Um, what they have done, there's, there's two things that, and we'll talk about this in a little while more, but there's two um, pathologies that they see on brains on postmortem 
in people with Alzheimer's disease, particularly, and those are called plaques and tangles. But um, if I were to, you know, uh, as a researcher, look at brains in the 30 and 40 year old, I'm going to see plaques and tangles at that point. Okay. Does that mean they have dementia? Particularly, no. It's when it really starts controlling your activities of daily living that it means it's getting worse and you're having more plaques and tangles. So, um, you know, if you were to look at a brain at someone that age and, and see those pathologies, it doesn't always mean that you're going or you do have dementia. New search supports complex ways our brain changes with age different from younger people. And we'll talk about that. And there may be a, a buildup of cognitive reserve to combat memory challenges and buffers against cognitive decline. Um, but it takes you to help build that. What they did find in these studies was that although the um, younger person had better recall of certain events and better memory, um, the, um, the memories and the um, problem solving that an older adult um, attains through life experience stays with them. So um, they may make better decisions if their brain is not, um, you know, has, they don't have any changes going on in their brain. So while we may forget where we left our car keys, we're gonna make, make better decisions about whether we should drive when we're tired or after dark or with alcohol. Um, so, and that all has to do with our life experience. So we need to seek out our role models for those with positive attitudes. Hanging around with uh, Debbie Downer is going to kind of spill onto your, um, you know, their, half, their glass is half full. And eventually if you keep, um, you know, living with or hanging out, you know, socializing with these people, you're going to see that your glass full starts to become half empty. So uh, we need to also live as a role model so others can live by our positive attitudes because people will emulate other people. And if we're negative and we're not, or we don't do what we need to do to be successfully aging and we have the ability to do it, um, then uh, you know, people are gonna look to us for um, their behaviors too. So let's talk about what we consider normal aging. Normal aging is characterized by a general slowing of cognitive execution. It may take us a little bit longer to think things through, and that's okay. We also may see a decline in flexi uh, mental flexibility. Um, you know, uh, I have a friend that, um, that we socialize with. And we're, when we're discussing going out to dinner, we have one couple that likes to go later in the evening. And we have another friend that likes to go earlier in the evening. And the one that likes to go older in the evening, well, you know, later in the evening, <laughs> excuse me, let me take a sip of my water, will change his plans and say, okay, we can go earlier. So he still has that mental flexibility, but Mike, it's got to be 430. If we don't eat at 430, he's not going. So very rigid in his behaviors, and that tends to make us older. So one of the things that we can do um, to, uh, to age successfully is try to break out of that box and be a little more flexible. <laughs> Excuse me. Sometimes we struggle to find the right word. I do that all the time. Um, that's not abnormal. When it becomes abnormal is when <clears throat> I can't find the right word and I substitute it with something else. So if I'm pointing to something in the kitchen and I can't remember the word refrigerator, at some point, they'll get the recall of that word. But if I call it carpet, I'm not even kind of in the same ballpark, if that makes sense. There is a slight decrease in short-term memory. Um, you can ask an older adult what they had for breakfast on Saturday, and this would be um, Thursday. So I'm asking you, 
last Saturday, what did you have for breakfast? You're not going to remember that. Um, but you know, someone who's younger might say, oh, you know, we went out to breakfast and I had eggs Benedict. Um, so that's okay. Uh, you might forget where you put your keys. Um, I probably lose my glasses and my phone um, 30 times a day. And that's just a normal part of aging. Intact memory for current uh, events. We do know who our president is. We do know what's going on in the world. <clears throat> so we'd have those um, memories for what's going on. Uh, we have independence in what we call our activities of, uh, of daily living. Our activities of daily living are bathing, feeding ourselves, uh, dressing, um, and then independent activities of daily living would be things like um, bill paying, you know, balancing your checkbook, doing your laundry, going grocery shopping, things that will create a concrete household for you. And we can do both of those in normal aging. Um, we do have a holding of verbal abilities and our vocabulary. Normal aging also, we see changes in perceptual uh, systems or speed of processing associated with normal aging can influence cognitive process, such attention and memory. So um, we'll see that their ability to perform uh, basic activities without needing assistance and the ability, the inability to perform independent activities of daily living. This is important um, for people who are wondering about a family member or themselves about um, dementia. We notice that the inability to perform independent activities of daily living typically precedes the inability to perform basic activities of daily living. So if you notice the inability to manage finances, it may be one of the earlier um, independent activities of daily living that would be a suggestive of dementia. And I, and, you know, my mom had Alzheimer's. She died. It'll be four years this September. She lived with it um, for about 12 years. One of our, um, you know, aha moments, like things weren't going so well. She was still living in her own home. We were um, giving her assistance with some grocery shopping um, just because um, she had really bad arthritis. So um, you know, we were trying to make things a little easier so she had more time to socialize. But one of the things that we did notice was the bills were piling up. She was not opening her mail and her bills were piling up and she wasn't paying things. And um, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time when um, we asked her um, about her gas bill and she hadn't paid it. She said, oh, just write on the envelope that I'm sick and send it back, they'll understand. And uh, so if any of you don't wanna pay your bills out there, go ahead and write that, make, uh, see if it works for you. It didn't work for my mom, that's for sure. We never let her do that, of course. Um, what we started doing is adding more um, supportive uh, services for her. And that was uh, supported services that, that we did. So you'll, you'll see that. If we look at our brain's vital statistics, um, we've got a billion neurons in our brain and a trillion synapses. Neurons and synapses are the important parts of our brain because that's what sends messages to other parts of the brain, to our spinal cord, to other parts of our body. The brain in a normal state weighs about three pounds and is about the size of a nice sized cauliflower. After age 60, the brain shrinks about a half to 1% of its volume every year. So our brain is getting smaller. Let's talk a little bit about the brain because when we talk about or you think about dementia, it's really those plaques and tangles that are in the brain and in any part of the brain, depending on what kind of dementia you have. But um, what the plaques and tangles do is um, they're kind of sticky substances and they prevent um, the oxygen and the blood flow to the brain um, to uh, do its job and keep those brain cells healthy. And we know that the brain controls many aspects of thinking, such as remembering, planning, organizing, making decisions, and concentration. We see changes in the brain um, as we age, 
and certain parts of the brain, like I said, will shrink. We see that communication between the neurons and the synapses I just talked about um, will, um, the communication is reduced and the blood flow to the brain may also decrease. We may see inflammation of the brain um, and that may occur. Um, there's a new study out that shows that there is increased inflammation in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, these people are just researching Alzheimer's, but, um, you know, so I don't know, I, I would assume that you would see inflammation on the different types of dementia, but specifically this research looked at Alzheimer's and they looked at brain tissue of people post-mortem who had Alzheimer's and they see significant inflammation. So there's things that we can do to keep the inflammation in our brain down. And we'll talk about that. The neurons um, and the synapses that I, I talked about or mentioned before um, is use it or lose it. Learning and performing new activities results in increased connections between our neurons. And then performing activities repetitively reinforces these connections. We know that age presents a decrease in the amount of white matter and functioning of mitochondria, which is a very cellular level of those neurons. It's kind of the center of every neuron. And various medical, genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors can influence decline in cellular functioning. So um, we need to look at just about everything that we do and how we can prevent the inflammation and how we can improve it. And we need to use it so we don't lose it. So we're gonna talk about something called neuroplasticity and brain games um, that we can do to help keep our brain healthy. Blood supply um, in normal aging is also associated with slightly uh, diminished cerebral or brain flow, uh, which may contribute to what's called white matter changes. And white matter in the brain is important. Um, so we need to make sure that we're keeping that blood flow consistent However, we know that there are some um, illnesses and chronic illnesses, what we call comorbidities, that decrease the blood flow to the brain. That would be diabetes, that would be cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, and diabetes. They're looking at diabetes as one of the significant causes for dementia. This just shows what a normal brain looks like on the left here. And you can see a lot of blood flow. You can see that the, the lobes of the brain are nicely intact. And then we see with mild cognitive impairment, the blood flow is a little bit less and the lobes are a little bit smaller. And then you can see with Alzheimer's disease that the blood flow is significantly declined and the lobes are almost, um, you can see non-existence. There's a lot of free space there. This is probably someone who's in the end stages of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, normal aging does lead to changes in all, si in all five senses. Um, we'll see that visual spatial difficulties may, um, may uh, occur. We'll see that auditory problems, we lose a little bit of our, our um, volume of hearing, or we may need the aid of a hearing aid. Uh, we may see some speech and language impairments. We may see changes in taste and smell. Um, changes in taste, that's why older adults like sweets. And that's why they like to salt their food because they're trying to get some taste out of their food that they normally got in a younger age without having to add that sweetness or that salt to it or a lot of spices. Um, changes in smell, I want to mention that um, one of the first uh, signs of Alzheimer's disease is a lack of smell. Um, we, we saw that with COVID, that was one of the first signs, and that's because it affects that part of the brain, which is, I believe, the um, parietal lobe, and um, that controls our smell and send signals to our nose to pick up those scents. Um, and um, we know that uh, COVID did uh, affect the brain um, quite often. 
and people, um, one of the long haul side effects of um, COVID for some people is their change in smell and their change in taste. Uh, people that I know that had COVID who had this, um, this lack of taste found it really disturbing um, that they weren't able to eat. Visual and spatial difficulties, you might see that your depth perception is a little bit off. So um, you really need to pay attention when you're walking and, and making sure you're not on your cell phone when you're walking. If you need to be on your cell phone, find a bench and sit down um, because visual and spatial difficulties as we age can lead to falls. Um, I always like to throw this in and you may have heard this before if you've been with me before, but this is a raw statistic that is really scary. 70% of the people over 70 who fall and fracture a hip will die within 18 months. Let me repeat that. 70% of the people over 70 who fall and fracture their hip will die within 18 months. That's a fact, that's a statistic. So our job as older adults and, and living a healthy older adult life is to keep ourselves standing straight, straight up. And we may find um, different ways to do that. We may need a cane, we may need a walker. I have an autoimmune disease that causes muscle fatigue. And um, because I wanna continue walking and I don't always wanna walk with my husband, not that I don't wanna be with them, I, there are, our times are just different. I, I bought myself some walking sticks and I walk with my walking sticks. Not only does it give me more support, <clears throat> it help, uh, also gives me upper body movement. So we all need to do what we need to do to stand up straight. Um, and a lot of those visual spatial difficulties lead to falls, so we have to be careful. We're gonna talk about the six pillars of brain health, and that is regular exercise, social engagement, healthy diet, mental stimulation, quality sleep, and stress management. All of things, these things will lead to brain health. So let's talk about mental fitness first. We need to make sure that um, we um, are mentally fit in our brain. So we need to exercise our brain. And how do we exercise our brain? Maybe we need to uh, learn a new language, maybe learning a musical instrument. I have a 73 year old friend who's taking piano lessons right now. She's always wanted to play the piano. She was a nurse with me at the hospital. So as I was, we were very busy raising kids and working and she never had time to um, play a musical instrument. And so she's always wanted to play piano. I don't know how successfully she is. She may not be able to play um, any Bach or Beethoven but she's exercising her brain. She is creating new synapses and neurons in those brain every time she challenges herself. Playing Scrabble. If you have a young grandchild and you like to socially interact with them, I uh, recommend the game Hangman. You can buy it on um, Amazon. And uh, it is a dry erase uh, board. It has um, a guy that has uh, red um, squares that you flip over and you create, um, you know, the, the game of hangman is actually one person putting down blanks and has a word in mind and the other person has to guess the word. And every time you guess wrong, um, it gets that person closer to hanging the, the guy. Um, and that's why it's called hangman. Why I suggest this is you don't have to be in the same room when, um, when we were in shutdown, what I did was I bought a hangman for myself and I bought a hangman for my, uh, my two grandsons who love playing hangman with me. And um, we played on Zoom and uh, we were able, the, the board is small enough, we were able to um, you know, show it on Zoom. So again, playing Scrabble, Wordle is a new one. My husband's playing Wordle. So those are word cross puzzles. Marjong, um, I'm not a math person, so that would just only cause me stress. Um, so anything you can do to challenge your brain. Interacting with others, we saw that cognitive decline happen during shutdown because there was little to no socialization. 
until people started learning how to, how to work Zoom if they could, or talking on the phone. Starting a new hobby, a lot of your senior centers have um, woodworking, um, they have crocheting. Um, I'm learning how to crochet. Uh, of course, it's taken me years. I say I'm learning because I'm still working on the same piece that I pull out and then I redo again. Learning a foreign language is a little bit harder when you're older, but it can be done. Um, volunteering is um, actually gets that part of your brain working that en engages empathy. Um, and that really um, produces more of those, um, those good, uh, feel good chemicals. Staying informed about world events. Um, I think it's important, but um, my, what my husband and I have done to re reduce our stress is uh, reduced how much we actually watch the news. We watch it once a day, we watch it at, um, at five o'clock and then we don't watch it again. Uh, you know, if the world's going to end, it's going to end. And what was happening is we were getting more and more stressed. Taking classes, taking any of these classes we offer, classes through your library, classes through your park district, and then social interaction, extremely important. This is um, a, a two minute memory test that you can practice. <clears throat> this will get your brain working. So of a brain game. Um, I found that on YouTube and you can find tons of brain games and brain exercises on, um, on YouTube and um, other platforms. You don't have to pay for those. Um, there are uh, companies that, that offer brain games with like a monthly fee. You don't have to do that. Um, working brain games are, you can do in the comfort of your own home with some of those suggestions such as you know, a hobby, uh, doing crossword puzzles. Um, I like doing uh, jigsaw puzzles on my, um, my iPad. So you can do jigsaw puzzles, anything where you're working the brain and, and you're making those new connections. Another thing that you can do to exercise your brain before we move on to healthy diet is to do something different every day and it's simple as using your um, left hand if you're right-handed um, to do an activity of daily living. So if you're right-handed, use your left hand to brush your teeth, use your left hand to comb your hair, put your clothes on differently tomorrow. Um, what's your usual routine? Do you put your socks on first? Do you put them on last? Do you put your pants on first? 
think about that and think about doing it a little bit different tomorrow. Something as simple as that creates new synapses in your brain. Let's talk a little bit about healthy diet. And I'm not going to go into every little thing about healthy diet, but I do want to tell you that there are foods that have the omega-3s in them that are extremely good for brain health and heart health. If you take care of your heart, it's going to take care of your brain. Um, there's a lot of studies done on coffee and, you know, there were years coffee's bad, coffee's good. Right now, if you're a coffee drinker, take advantage of the fact that coffee's good right now. Blueberries, wonderful um, source of vitamins and brain uh, power. Turmeric is an anti-inflammatory. I just visited my local um, in downtown Arlington. There's a um, health food store and it's owned by um, a woman who is actually a pharmacist in Poland. And uh, so I go there occasionally to um, you know, get some vitamins. And I had told her I was on turmeric and she asked me when I was taking turmeric and I take it right after uh, with all my other medications or vitamins in the morning after breakfast. And she said, turmeric needs to be taken on an empty stomach because the um, acids in your stomach break down the turmeric before it even leaves your stomach and it doesn't do you any good. So all this time I've been doing it wrong. And so she said, take it two hours before, take it two hours after. If you can cook with turmeric, it's in its raw form, it's better. Uh, there's turmeric tea out there. So that is a great anti-inflammatory. Broccoli is good. Pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, you need to go 75 or higher, but you can have chocolate. Um, every night, my, we usually at the store will get a bar of chocolate that's about 75% um, or 70% is even good. And we have a, a little square of dark chocolate every night about eight o'clock, that's our kind of our treat. Oranges, eggs, and green tea, but the list goes on and on. All you have to do is Google um, uh, um, foods that are, will help with brain power, and the list is endless. Also put foods that are non and because we know that um, some dementias now, particularly Alzheimer's, has an inflammatory factor to it, I would Google in non-inflammatory foods um, and see what, what comes up. Let's talk a little bit about physical exercise and this is your brain on exercise. Exercise is good for your body and your brain. Here's what happens to your brain when you exercise. Your heart rate speeds up and your body starts to work hard. Your brain recognizes these responses as stressors and responds by releasing chemicals that protect you from stress. BDNF and endorphins. BDNF repairs and protects your memory neurons and clears your mind so you can make good decisions. Exercise also increases blood flow to the brain, improving brain cell activity and focus. Increased oxygen in the brain as a result of increased blood flow creates new cells in the parts of your brain that control learning and memory. Endorphins help reduce discomfort, block feelings of pain, and cause pleasure. These feelings can last for hours after you have finished exercising, which is why you feel happier, more relaxed, and less stressed after a workout. Regular exercise over a long period of time can help protect you from anxiety and depression, increase brain cell function, improve your memory, and may help prevent many diseases. Regular exercise may also improve your self-esteem as you feel more confident about your looks and what you can do. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that adults get at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. Just 30 minutes a day of walking, moving around, or even dancing can build a stronger, healthier brain. So what I wanna to talk to you about um, uh, brain, uh, I'm sorry, exercise, is that you don't have to be jumping around. You can do chair yoga. You can do um, just dancing, like they said, walking. Uh, for 30 minutes a day. And if a 30 minute walk is too much at one time because of arthritis or other um, issues going on in your body, do two 15 minute walks. Um, if it's too cold and too um, hard to walk outside, there is, uh, again, um, if you just go into YouTube and you go uh, type in walking for older adults, 
they'll be um, walking exercises for you to do. But 30 minutes a day is important. Um, we know that it increases your heart rate and they talked about the, the release of hormones. It also promotes that brain plasticity that we talked about and creates new connections. This was an interesting slide I wanted to show you. This is a brain after quietly sitting for a while and you don't see a lot of blood flow and look at how the blood flow goes. Uh, it increases after a 20 minute walk. It's pretty profound. Sleep and relaxation. The uh, CDC is now recommending that um, older adults get at least seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Um, for some people that's difficult because uh, of insomnia. Um, I would see your physician if you're having difficulties um, having uh, difficulty sleeping, but things like disconnecting from your uh, electronics at least an hour before you go to sleep, um, keeping your, your uh, room cooler will help you sleep, uh, getting comfortable sleep clothing and uh, journaling. Um, some people uh, kind of journal before they go to sleep and it kind of decreases some of the day's anxieties. So again, getting that sleep and relaxation, your brain needs that to regenerate. One of the things that you can do is what we call mindful meditation during the day. You don't even have to be sitting with your eyes closed and your knees up and your hands. You can do mindful meditation when you're just laying in bed. Um, I have a son who's a, a firefighter paramedic and there's a lot of stress in that job. And um, before he gets up every morning, before he even gets out of bed, he does a few minutes of meditation. And it really has helped decrease some of the day's anxiety. So we know that mindful meditation changes uh, gray matter volume. It increases it, it reduces activity in the me center of the brain. We have a me center of the brain. And when we, I talked about volunteering, it'll take you out of that me center of the brain, but mindful meditation also reduces that me center of the brain. It enhances connectivity between brain region, uh, regions and can be done anywhere. It frees, uh, frees the brain from anxiety, anger, and toxic thoughts. Um, and, and mind wandering is, is associated with being less happy. So you're really focused when, um, when you're doing uh, your mindful meditation. And you can do it before you go to bed, get up um, anytime during the day that you feel like you're, you can take five, 10 minutes. We've talked a little bit about social interactions. Um, get out there, get talking to people, get on the phone, find something, uh, go to the senior centers or join a, a card club, um, but do something that, inter that you interact. Um, people who um, babysit for their grandchildren, it's been shown that there's a reduction uh, of um, cognitive impairment. So, um, you know, I, I love watching my grand my grandkids. Um, I only do like two at a time um, because they well, we have three older ones and then the other two are younger, um, four are younger. So I try to, um, you know, take them two at a time and engage with them. And we play games, board games, and we play cards and um, and and because we're with our grandchildren, it's creating new synapses in our brains. And, and it's bridge, bridging those generational um, things that we hear about, those biases. And, um, and you know, it, it just really helps. And besides, I want them to say nice things about me after I'm gone. So again, social interaction, extremely important. Here's some strategies for adults for memory, um, for improving your memory. So think about this. Nowadays, a lot of people are obsessed with a healthy lifestyle. They eat wholesome food, work out at the gym, and all that jazz. But they tend to forget that our brain needs exercise too. Especially if you've started having memory lapses more often. Um, what did I just say? Oh yeah. So if people keep saying you have the memory of a goldfish, don't fret. Just try these simple brain exercises to help you out. Number 1. Read books aloud. In 2017, the University of Waterloo conducted an experiment where they asked 95 participants to read silently, listen to someone else read, listen to a recording of themselves reading, 
and read out loud in real time. Later, participants were required to repeat words they read. It turned out the word recall was greatest in the group that read aloud to themselves. When you speak and hear yourself speaking at the same time, it helps the brain to store the information. You can practice this exercise with your friend or a child. Also, you can try to switch to audiobooks. Listening to them engages the imagination and brain regions in a different way than silent reading. Number 2. Switch hands during daily activities. Only 1% of the world doesn't have a dominant hand. Everyone else uses either the right one or the left one to read, cut food, paint, and so on. But if you try to switch to your other hand, it'll strengthen neural connections in your brain, making your mind and memory sharper. Use your opposite hand while brushing your teeth, cleaning, or washing the dishes. But hey, please don't try this exercise while you're driving or doing brain surgery. It might seem really hard the first time you do it, but it'll give your brain the perfect kind of stimulation by adjusting. Just keep practicing this exercise regularly. Number 3. Elevate your heart rate 3 times a week. Regular aerobic exercise may increase the size of the hippocampus. No, that's not the University of Hippo. It's the part of the brain responsible for transforming information into new memories. A study published in 2011 backs up the idea about the positive impact working out has on our memory. According to it, aerobic exercises that pump up your heart rate help the brain store long-term memories. But even if breaking a sweat at the gym isn't exactly your thing, you can just take a brisk walk for 20 minutes, three times a week, and still get the same effect. 4. Eat with chopsticks. It's one of the most effective ways to make your brain perform better. And here's how it works. Using chopsticks grows new dendrites, which are extensions of nerve cells. They help to transmit impulses from cell to cell. This means that these dendrites have a positive impact on communication between brain cells. What's more, involving the concentrated areas of nerve cells in your fingertips in this activity boosts the circulation in the brain. And as a bonus, switching to chopsticks improves your digestion and helps control calorie intake. So I want everyone to go out and buy chopsticks um, and try eating with chopsticks. Um, just kidding. But those are some of the strategies. You can find the rest of this on YouTube at 11 quick uh, exercises uh, to improve your memory. So um, this really concludes our, our talk on um, successful aging. And uh, I will open it up for comments or questions. So I'm going to give it back to you, Dina. Because it's so Thank hard. Thank you. Chris, that was am amazing. Oops. Sorry. Let me get That's rid of okay. this. Um, I forgot to put this on there. There's a fountain of youth. This is what Sophie Loren said. There's a fountain of youth. Uh, it's your mind, your talents, the creativity you bring to your life, and the lives of people you love. When you learn to tap this source, you will truly have a defeated age. And uh, Sophia Loren's still with us. So um, anyway, sorry, Dina, but back to you again. Not a problem. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if someone does, you can raise, you, if you want to raise your hand, you can as well, or put it in the question answers. Um, Chris, I was very excited to see that blueberries and chocolate we're on that list. They're two of my personal favorites. So I eat blueberries almost every day. Um, yep, me too. And the only way I get caffeine is with chocolate. So there you go. Yeah. I, so I think that, there's there's that thing at Costco, the uh, Aussie blueberries, the chocolate covered Aussie blueberry blueberries. Ooh. Um, I don't know if there's more sugar in it though, because it's processed. That's yeah, the problem. It you might know, be. Really, a lot of your um, anti-inflammatory foods, um, uh, your inflammatory foods, I should say, are a lot of processed and sugar, foods that have a lot of sugar in it. So the big thing on this too is stay away from sugar. Yeah. So, so I don't see any questions. What I am going to say is thank you everyone for joining us today. 
Um, I am always honored when I get to, to be on with Chris because I learn something new from every time I sit with her. And I think it's, it's just something that we at ElderWorks love to do is to educate and share for better aging. Um, if anyone needs anything, please feel free to, to reach out to our team at ElderWorks and we will help you with better aging. In the chat, I did put the JOT form. So if you each could fill out your survey, that would be wonderful. I'm also going to be putting up a second link. Um, and the second link I am putting up, which I'm gonna put up right now, is for our stepping out to fitness in May. And in May, we will be doing the stepping out to fitness. And as Chris said in this, um, activity today or this educational seminar that um, stepping out to fitness is part of that physical exercise and helping you get that um, right check out check out that link it's fun and those that participate will be entered into a raffle um, and you get a really cool t-shirt our uh, creative team um, at elderworks put a really pretty blue t-shirt out for our may um, and, uh, Olga, thank you for your feedback. I appreciate that. Chris, she says it was a very informative session. Thank you, um, Olga. And I, I thank everyone that joined us today. Um, if, and I, if, I think we're, we're done. We will stay here for just a little bit. If anyone has any additional questions that pop in, but please do do that uh, survey um, for us on the education so that we know how we're doing and what next topics you would like to see as well. And Chris, anything else you have? I think that's it. All Thanks, right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.